Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, depending on where you're based. Welcome to breakout session A4, plant protein literacy, protein quality, satiety, and performance, O, oh, and taste. Um, we'll be following up a little bit on the general session that you saw earlier and adding a bit more to that. So um, with that, I would like to welcome our moderator, Marie Moldy, who is a registered dietitian at Data Central. Welcome, Marie. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Katie. And thank you to those of you tuning in to our session this afternoon. Uh, I, this is going to be an exciting session. It's a bit of a hybrid where uh, we're first going to see a very craveable plant forward culinary demo. And then we're going to transition into a Q&A with three industry experts. So uh, I think I'll introduce our, our first panelist right away and get things started. Uh, we are first going to hear from Chef Tony Sakaguchi. Uh, chef Tony is the executive chef for the Strategic Initiatives Group at the CIA. Uh, she's worked at a number of the top restaurants in our country. And today her culinary demo is going to focus on the plant forward kitchen with a Mediterranean twist. So welcome, Chef Tony. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much for the introduction. And um, so I'm going to demonstrate a dish to illustrate practical strategies for plant forward menus. You know, I think um, Eve mentioned earlier in one of the earlier sessions that many cuisines are naturally plant forward or plant based and um, using meat as the seasoning and vegetables as the center of stage. So I'm gonna demonstrate a bowl that will illustrate this. And you are gonna turn to the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean. And um, we're gonna prepare a Mediterranean power bowl with Mahamara and Aleppo mint ochre. Okay, so, you know, bowls, I think they're really versatile and they're really popular. Um, it's easy to kind of select the flavor profile you want to work with and then adjust your ingredients based on what flavor profile you're in. And you can keep the base simple and make the toppings the most interesting part. So for the base of my bowl, I have, um, let's see, so I have, um, it's uh, roasted cauliflower. So it's just roasted really high heat. Um, so that um, it caramelizes slightly, just seasoned really simply with salt and pepper. I have some lentils and quinoa in here also. And I think, you know, with the lentils and quinoa, you can use whatever grains you want to, you know, really just think about texture and variety and what you want it to add to the bowl. Um, I have some kale in here and the kale is, um, is uh, you know, you massage it, you season it, you take some garlic that you mash to a paste with some salt, and then you add it to the kale with some extra virgin olive oil olive oil, sorry, and then you kind of gently massage it, not so much to pulverize it, but you just want to gently bruise it so it becomes kind of translucent like this. But it makes it much more tender and easier to, um, to eat. I hate, you know, raw kale salads. Um, and then also parsley leaves in here, because I think, you know, they add a really nice, clean, bright, grassy flavor to this mixture. And then the other part that we have in here are preserved lemons. And with the preserved lemons, um, you know, they're salt brine, uh, they're brined um, or salted, um, lemons, and you generally use the rind. And the main thing is that slice them really thin because they tend to be really salty and just kind of intense. So you don't want a huge bite, you just want a little bit. Okay, so that's our bowl base. And then for the toppings, I have a um, fava bean and um, shaved uh, raw asparagus salad. And so this is blanched fava beans, shaved asparagus that's raw, tossed with some lemon zest and mint, and a little bit of olive oil and um, salt and pepper and lemon. Okay, and then for the sauce on here, I have a um, mahamara. So mahamara is a um, Syrian origin. It's a Mediterranean olive oil based sauce. And um, it's made with roasted peppers, walnuts, um, tomato paste, like a Turkish tomato paste. So it's kind of intense and extra virgin olive oil. And then it's seasoned with cumin, toasted cumin, Aleppo peppers, and then pomegranate molasses, which adds this kind of a tangy um, sweetness to it. Okay, and so think of it as, uh, you know, like the Turkish and Syrian uh, cousin of Spain's Romesco sauce. You know, it's delicious with um, proteins, um, animal proteins or plant-based proteins, vegetables, or you can use it as part of a meze. Okay, I also have an egg here. And, you know, so the egg is just going to be our animal protein. You could skip it if you want to and make this vegan very easily because there's already a lot of protein in the base of the bowl. I have some grilled eggplant here. And so the eggplant just... I think eggplant is delicious with mahamara, so I couldn't resist putting it on there. 
We have some pickled turnips, and this is our acidic ingredient. And so this adds a little bit of acid, a nice foil to the richness of the sauce, and then also the intensity of the ingredients in the bowl. Um, but just, you know, a seven day uh, fermentation at room and temperature it has a little bit of beet in there also. Okay, we have our yogurt, which sorry, is not a bag, but um, it's um, oat yogurt with um, Aleppo peppers and then dried mint. And so in the yogurt sauce, quite often in the Mediterranean Eastern part, you're going to find that they use dried mint instead of fresh mint, you know, because it's a very different flavor. Okay, and then to finish, we have some crispy chickpeas. So these are chickpeas that were roasted um, over high heat and then seasoned with zatar. And so these um, zatar is a Middle Eastern spice mixture and it's based on wild thyme, sumac, which is kind of a souring spice, and then uh, sesame seeds and salt. So it adds this kind of sour salt um, finish to the dish. So we'll go ahead and assemble. And so I'm just gonna take some of the base and a couple spoonfuls. Okay, more than a couple. <laughs> All right, so we want our base for the bowl here. And then we're going to add our fava beans. I'm going to put some gloves on here. Um, we're going to add our fava bean salad and then um, the mahamara and the, egg, the eggplant right next to that. So we'll do this. I'm going to put our fava beans down. Whoops. Okay. Yeah. More fava. Okay, do a spoonful of the mahamara right next to that. Okay, I'm gonna do a couple of pieces of eggplant there, like that. We'll add our egg. You know, you could, in, like I said, um, you could leave the egg off if you wanted to keep it vegan. We're gonna add a couple of pickles to this. So the turnips, um, you know, they're pretty, um, not really acidic, but they have this nice salty richness to them. And then we're gonna drizzle a little bit of this yogurt on top of the eggplant over here. And we're gonna finish it with some chickpeas over top. And then a little bit of micro cilantro. And so I use cilantro, I know there's parsley in here, but cilantro and, and parsley are a really common um, combination that you might find in the um, Eastern Mediterranean. Okay, so anyway, so this is our um, Mediterranean Power Bowl with a, a mahamara and a lepo mint yogurt. Thanks. Thank you, Chef Tony. Wow, that looks excellent and makes me wish that we were together in New York and, and could try that. But I guess that means we all just have to make it at home uh, sometime this summer. So, uh, all right, next, I would love to bring up our three panelists for our discussion this afternoon. Um, let's see, we have a familiar face joining us in Sophie Egan. Uh, Sophie is the author of How to Be a Conscious Eater. She's the founder of Full Table Solutions Consulting Practice. Uh, she is an internationally recognized leader when it comes to food and health and, and climate. And uh, you'll recognize her if you tuned in this morning to our uh, keynote session. Uh, next is Christopher Gardner. Uh, Christopher is another uh, familiar Menus of Change face. Uh, he is the Renborg Farquhar, I hope I pronounced that right, Christopher. Renborg Farquhar, professor of medicine at Stanford. Uh, he's done a ton of cool research when it comes to nutrition, and I'm so excited to pick his brain on uh, ways we can think about nutrition of plant-forward diets. And then lastly, we have a, a new person joining us, and that's my colleague, uh, Carly Levin from Data Central. Uh, Carly is our plant-based expert at Data Central. I can say from personal experience, she is truly a plant-based expert. She's a 16-year vegetarian. She's expert in synthesizing our data into uh, actionable insights for our customers when it comes to plant-based. So welcome to the panelists. Thank you for being here with us. And we do have uh, you know, only 30 or so minutes together, so we will dive right in. And Carly, I think I'll position this first question first to you. And that's the, you know, you were a, a key author on the Plant Forward Opportunities Report that Jack just uh, shared this morning. 
Um, could you share with us anything that surprised you from that report or any key learnings uh, when it comes to what consumers today want from plant forward dining? One thing that wasn't necessarily surprising, but is a good reminder is that, you know, most consumers don't drastically want to change their dietary habits. And that's something we need to consider when thinking through how do we promote plant-based and how do we promote the messaging around it. Um, for a lot of people, it's baby steps. Um, maybe even a whole meatless Monday is too drastic, but maybe simple steps of substituting like beans or tofu for their animal protein in a bowl, like the chef just shared, is an easy way for most people to um, continue to eat more plant-based foods. And I think that's something really important. And that's kind of the lens that we should view um, the entire scope of, you Know, educating people around the plant based group. Thank you, Carly. And uh, I'll position that same question, I think, to, to Sophie and Christopher as well. So, Sophie, what were some key takeaways for you when it came to the report? Or maybe what stood out to you when it comes to audiences that are interested in Plant Forward, or maybe some audiences who are going to need more help? You know, I think what really uh, struck me is really the, the differences by generation. And so we have seen from Data Central over the years that this is kind of one of your, your many strengths. Um, but it's particularly interesting in the context that I work in of campus dining because, you know, leading the Minnesota Change University Research Collaborative, we um, are all working together to accelerate healthy, sustainable, delicious food choices with university students. And there is this assumption, and Jack spoke to this, but I think it's the real surprise for many people. There's the assumption that Gen Zers will be sort of millennials on steroids or like plus plus concerned about all the things that they were before. Like, no, no, no. Millennials are the uniquely most, I think he said, you know, food forward or something great like that. Yeah. Um, kind of the most embracing of plant forward. And so that really puts, um, especially folks in university settings or anyone really looking to the future, which is the, probably everyone in this audience, um, how do we how do we juxtapose these, right? And I remember learning from Data Central years ago that actually it's because of who your parents are. And so it's Gen Z are uh, really more likely to be uh, similar to Gen X, the the people they you know the the uh, born from, and it's really looking at how okay does the total culture get affected by millennials just because of our our millennial sheer yeah. purchasing power, our sheer numbers, um, and what are sort of the lasting effects from the millennial generation that came before that have unaltered have made unalterable sort of shifts but then what are the distinct needs uh, of this generation and so i'm really looking at those areas where you know they're very practical they're really looking for cost conscious you know convenience meet, meeting my daily needs but then there's also these social movements that we see just separate from food issues of social justice racial justice i've seen other sets that have really shown how millennials or gen z excuse me really want to see their food identity, their identities expressed through the companies that they that they support. And that they will choose, they will drop a company. There's no brand loyalty. They will drop a company if it's not aligned with their core values in terms of social, racial justice, all these other elements. Uh, and so what I'm really eager, where I see the opportunity to me, is to better connect the dots between things we know Gen Z care about. And even mention the climate crisis, which all kinds of other data suggests they absolutely care a lot about. They're just not yet seeing the connections to food and yeah. especially often not to food and agriculture where food is coming from and so the more that we can position these not necessarily as you heard from food for climate league by banging people over the head with the message about climate the more that we can meet those needs um, and better connect these other areas that we know they care about i think we can address some of that gap and, and kind of position gen z to be more like millennials if you will at least in their willingness to embrace plant forward eating yeah, wow, thank you, Sophie. That does seem like a tremendous opportunity for education. And I love that you brought in values too. Uh, I like sort of the saying, some of us grew up hearing, you are what you eat. And today it's more like you eat what you are and your food choices reflect who you are as an individual. I like um, that, I like that. Yeah, so Christopher, um, I heard you mention today you wished you could do research as fast as we can at Data Central with our <laughs> consumer surveys, but uh, um, would you, besides maybe the generational insights, did you have anything from the report that stuck out to you as surprising or an opportunity when it comes to Plant Forward? Yep, so from my perspective, I teach a lot of Stanford students and I was surprised about the Gen Z thing, absolutely. So mirroring everything that Sophie did, 
I'll add to that perspective that I think for years I've been moving in that direction and it was all about climate change and maybe water. And one of the things that's come up recently is this concept called planetary boundaries, which is biodiversity, land use, nitrogen, phosphorus. So I've been teaching a couple classes like this and it all comes back to food. Every time we go into this, it comes back to food. And they're like, oh my God, it's the same thing. Oh my God, it's the same thing. And so I will also echo Sophie's point that whereas before, I really thought we were getting into climate change and the students would stop me, the Gen Zers, and say, wait, 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 social justice. I said, I'm getting there. That's next class. No, no, we're doing social justice today. And so I'm really getting them on board on that. If I can connect that dot, as Sophie was saying, yeah. in the university dining hall. So yes, I was really surprised by the Gen Zers, but I think if we dig deeper, I think there's a path there to understanding yeah. more. And definitely has to do too with, you know, a little bit of, uh, again, coming to the Food for Climate perspective, it's it's not just sort of the message, but when you communicate, when you educate, right? Maybe the minute you walk into the dining hall, it's not when you want to learn about carbon footprint and, you know, these conditions of farm workers and so forth. Like, that's a lot to process when you're just hungry trying to decide what to eat. But in a class like Christopher's, when you are more primed, maybe you're more receptive to this in other avenues. Um, so really it's, it's what's the message? Who is the messenger? Who are those most influential voices? And then when is, is the message going to be most likely well received to ultimately influence the decision that the point of purchase, but it might not be at that point of purchase to actually say, give all that information. Yeah, that's a great point. So thinking about the touch points we have with consumers, students or otherwise, and right. when that ideal opportunity for education is. Uh, cool. Well, let's see. Uh, Carly, I'd, I'd like to ask you, maybe speaking from a research perspective, what we've seen at Data Central, uh, we've moved through and largely past the pandemic, ho hopefully at this point. Um, how did the pandemic impact consumers' views on plant-forward eating? Sure. Well, um, based on the research we did in the middle of the pandemic, most consumers still were interested in the exact same trends that they were um, before the pandemic. And one of those was plant-based. So that has not changed. And another thing I think um, that the pandemic gave a unique opportunity for is especially at the beginning, we saw a lot of supply shortages, um, especially among meat. And I think there's a subset of consumers that may have had the opportunity to try plant-based meat that perhaps never would have or would have been much slower to adopt that were forced to because of scarcity on the retail shelf. Yeah, I remember seeing those uh, pictures of empty shelves and, and first time trial for, yes, some, some of those alternatives definitely probably happened then. Um, thank you. Uh, Christopher, you mentioned this morning some of the nutrition research you've done about plant forward diets and how they are as quality as, as diets that include animal protein. And meanwhile, or that being said, there are so many misbeliefs out there that plant protein isn't as high quality, that it's not as filling, even though certain things like beans or nuts are thought to be um, filling or uh, almost as filling as animal protein. So we have this issue with protein literacy. People don't really understand what protein is, what it does for us, and how much do we need. So how can we best go about uh, clarifying that message? Oh, it's a tough one. We need the chefs to get in there and we need these research partnerships that Menus of Change has been doing a great job doing between chefs and researchers. That's what we do at the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative. So we actually have different currencies. The chefs really need great customer satisfaction and the researchers need publications. And so one of the really fun things we've been doing is trying to use dining halls as living laboratories and exposing them to some behavior issues. Can I just share one that was like our pinnacle paper that came out already? We renamed some vegetables. We had about 17 different vegetables over the course of an academic quarter. And they would come out multiple times during the quarter. And so we'd take one opportunity to provide a health-based name and one a basic name and one an indulgent name. And the key to this whole study, here's research and chefs working together. The key to the whole study was that the recipe never changed. All we did was change the framing of the name. Hmm. And so we had basically carrots or we had 
fiber-rich carrots, oh, presence of a glorified nutrient, low-sodium carrots, absence of a vilified nutrient, or we had twisted citrus-glazed carrots, but they were all twisted citrus-glazed carrots. They actually were nothing but those every time. We just changed the name. Okay, so that may, maybe the obvious one is the students took more twisted citrus-glazed carrots than the others. But the shocking thing for me as a researcher is when we just said basic carrots or high fiber or low sodium carrots, they took fewer low sodium and high fiber carrots as if we've created this association between health and a lower quality of taste. Huh. That's where I think the chefs can really help us because they can make everything taste great. And I think they can bring back this concept of just because it's healthy doesn't mean it's not going to be unapologetically delicious. And that's that's why these have become my favorite new partners, because they're able to carry that message, whereas I can't in my bars and charts and graphs. Hmm. Wow, that's so interesting and shows the power of messaging. To a, yeah, I just put in, in the chat two links to what Christopher's talking about. The, uh, the DISH study was the academic publication, that multi-site study, and then we actually created a toolkit for food service operators to use these findings. It's called the Edgy Veggies Toolkit. So definitely uh, check out those two links I just dropped in. Thanks, Thank Sophie. you, Sophie. Um, let's see. So let's talk for a second about storytelling. So this, uh, Christopher, you just kind of teed this up well, the importance of messaging. So we know that consumers respond really well to storytelling. If there's a personal narrative around maybe a dish that they're choosing. So what are your thoughts on that? What kind of narratives can we use or should we leverage as we promote the plant forward way? Uh, how about, uh, Christopher, do you mind taking that? Sure. Yeah. So the, the fun that I've had in my classes, Marie, is to see that I can't find a single message that resonates with everyone. So I can do animal rights and welfare and I'll get a bunch of students on board. I can do climate change. I'll get a bunch of students on welfare. I'll get human labor abuses in slaughterhouses, for example, like the amount of meat that we consume is closely tied to the labor abuses in slaughterhouses of immigrant populations that get underpaid and their, their health care is lousy, agricultural workers, fast food workers. If I use all three of those, I can get every single student riled up in class. But if I just pick one of those, what's fascinating is somebody, it just doesn't resonate. That's not the thing that gets them. And huh. so instead of just counting on all these messages resonating with everyone, I feel like I need a tool chest I say, okay, what do you think about that animal rights and welfare? Oh, I, I see you're not paying attention. Climate change, did you? No, that's the slaughterhouse workers. Oh, now you're pissed. Okay, let's talk about that. How did, so for my narrative, I feel like I, I'm looking for those different hooks for different people because most of them actually point in the same direction to plant forward. Yeah, no, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Sophie, do you have thoughts to add there? I do, yeah. So this is really, the narrative is what Food for Climate League is born to address. So I'm here in this panel wearing multiple hats, if you can see the stack on my head. Um, but Food for Climate League is a research collaborator of Menus of Change University Research Collaborative, and I, I have the, the great opportunity to work in both organizations. And really the thrust of Food for Climate League's whole findings is that Christopher is really onto something there, which is you have to speak to people's values, absolutely, what they care most about. But those things might change over time, right? It might be dependent on a life stage. It might be um, unique to certain demographics. And so what Food for Climate League, we're really looking to align messaging with both demographic and psychographic profiles, which are often overlooked, the psychographic piece. And the big thrust uh, of our 10 best practices for how to talk about food and climate are that by and large, speaking about climate smart food and climate smart behaviors in general, has only spoken to one of the three core human needs that we all, these are universal, they're not by generation, they're not by life stage per se. And those are control, community, and purpose. Mm -hmm. And so when you can, in the past, when it's only spoken to purpose, it's like eat less meat because the planet is counting on you or go zero waste or else the polar bears will have no ice left, right? Those messages speak to some percentage of people who are motivated by that, but you're leaving out huge swaths of other people who are really mm -hmm. looking for how climate smart eating can make them feel connected to their local community, part of in belonging and part of a of a of a social structure and network that supports them. Control of their health. 
whatever it is. And so that's what the continuous you know, practices um, really do. And, it, and we're actually now embarking on a really interesting new study, which we're finally getting MCRC together, um, all about the labeling. So what terms, what, what framing, and how can we use perhaps visuals? This was something that came up um, in the last session about photography. Um, there's a real interest in, what about iconography? Little, you know, caricatures mm. or kind of shorthands, you know, stoplight systems uh, and, and so forth. And there's just, this is a big wide open piece of inquiry that needs so much more research. So it's great that we have these two organizations, but it's kind of, those are the kind of key findings we're, we're seeing so far of some opportunities that haven't yet been sufficiently seized upon and that really have opportunity to to make these ways of eating resonate with the masses. Huh. Wow, that's so fascinating, Sophie. Thank you for sharing that. And I guess so thinking about we all have an interest in Gen Z consumers and we did want to hone in on that consumer in this discussion a bit. So would, do we feel like generally to reach that person and and uh, persuade them to move toward plant forward, maybe it is more of a climate message than a health message. Is that maybe what the data is showing or can we surmise that or, or would you say otherwise? I, I'm curious if Carly has an insight there first, but and then I can jump in. Um, our research has shown that Gen Z is more um, interested in a climatarian diet um, is how we was. So, and I think, you know, I think they're well aware of that they are going to inherit most of the climate issues that even millennials um, may not live to see. So I think it's going to become even more of a pressing issue the older they get. I mean, what I was going to say is that um, what I've been seeing is that really increasingly climate and sustainability, along with social responsibility, are becoming table stakes, right? It's long been said that kind of... Um, you know, in from being essential, these things like convenience or table stakes. And, and you start to see that it, it becomes a liability if you don't have as a company, you know, your climate action plan or your um, uh, plan for addressing racial equity or whatever it is, you know, those have become question marks for, for many, many Gen Zers, especially like Christopher said, are raising these questions instantly. They need to know now, <laughs> but again, it's about what level of detail and when do you share that, right? So um, to your question, is it a climate message? It's hard to say that because what we're really trying to tease apart is really more on the behavioral science aspect, right? When are you in um, a moment where you are willing to kind of absorb that information? How much information? Um, so it's all kinds of things. It's like um, your hunger level, your mood. And, and the more that we, um, so we, we know that in general, Gen Z cares more like, like Carly said, but it might be along the lines of just talking about how absolutely delicious and phenomenal the specific dishes or your menu or your offerings are, but then on your website, having that kind of deep dive that a person can go and kind of do their homework and feel like their, their values are aligned. They're not, their identity, like I mentioned before, is being expressed through the company that they're choosing or the, through the organization that they're part of. Um, but it's, we actually have five best practices for Climate League that even include climate in the message and five that down. And that actually again kind of has to do with things like also um, context. Is this a celebratory occasion, for example? Maybe that's not as um, prime of a, of a location, right? Um, doing some interesting work, starting to get involved with like sports arenas and concessions. Again, these are kind of more indulgent environments where it's probably not best to be bringing that up. But maybe in the dining hall where it's more of your home, it's your repeat um, place that you're there all the time, it might be some more receptivity. So we have to tease apart those kind of pieces, but it's definitely true that, that these issues are um, of greater significance to, to Gen Z. Uh, and it's just a matter of finding the right ways to kind of tailor the message with the timing, with the physical context, um, and above all, not forget to leave with flavor. One of the best menus of change principles there is. I will second that. Thank you, Sophie. That was such a thoughtful answer to that question and a, a great segue into a great question from our audience, which Carly, I'd love to uh, get your thoughts on this one. So uh, the notion is that Gen Z is more diverse uh, than any other generation and they value their cultural identities. So when we think about plant forward innovation, do you think we need to look at innovative approaches to include more varied ethnic and cultural cuisines? Uh, to, to better target Gen Z consumers or, or spark their interest in, in Plan Forward? 
I do. I think that's important. And I think leveraging a lot of cuisines that are already naturally plant-based or plant-forward, I mean, why reinvent the wheel, right? And um, we're seeing just across menus, not just necessarily with plant-based, a lot of these dishes are actually trending already. So it's a good opportunity to leverage that. And I've always said, and our data shows as well, that um, most consumers, when they're looking to eat plant-based or plant-forward, if they already are one of those consumers like me, you don't want special plant-based trends. You want to eat the same food everyone else's, just a plant-based version. Um, Christopher and I were actually talking about this earlier. I asked him if he'd tried any vegan poke. We're seeing that where, you know, it's a trend-forward dish. Um, the simple swap, you take out the fish and you replace it usually with tofu, beets, or even watermelon. So I think utilizing a lot of um, those trending dishes and um, cuisines already, um, lots of which happen to be global, are um, very important and I think will be useful for Gen Z. Thank you, Carly. And you know, one other, this is another question from the audience that builds on this. So thinking about plant forward dishes, maybe like is the best approach when you're trying to go plant forward to maybe have a meal you can share with others. Mm -hmm. So if you listen to Jack's presentation this morning, he mentioned he got chicken tikka masala, but if he was maybe sharing that with a bigger group, could he have gotten maybe a lot of other veggie dishes and had a couple bites of chicken and felt satisfied with that? Uh, Sophie, would you mind sharing your thoughts on best, uh, best, practices for plant forward dining or dishes? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's really important is even that we're all using the same terms, right? We were using plant-based and plant forward throughout today interchangeably, but they're not the same. So plant-based is foods that are 100% from the plant kingdom, right? All those good foods we've talked about, legumes, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, plant oils, um, herbs and spices. I'm sure I left out fruits and vegetables. Um, plant forward is really the emphasis and celebration of those foods. It includes vegan and vegetarian. Um, this is the, a beautiful definition that we in CIA, um, uh, I helped you know, write in advance as a B2B term for the industry. Um, and we're really so excited by the uptake. But it's important to know that that is a big tent approach that includes so much flexibility. And that's the mirror of that is flexitarian that we saw in Jack's presentation. You saw how much higher that was than the other options. It's because it allows for the most flexibility. So you could have a vegan breakfast, a vegetarian lunch, and maybe a fully carnivorous dinner, right? right. And it's, it's really about just ratios and the total makeup of your eating pattern versus very strict, strict regimens of, you know, binary in or out or kind of all or nothing. And what the other consumer insights data shows is that far more people in the US are open to eating in that way than are or self-identify already as kind of flexitarian. It's, I mean, numbers have shifted, but it's like roughly a third um, mm -hmm. versus, you know, we're talking about like three to 5%, um, maybe five to 7% in the vegetarian space. Um, and so that's still great and, and, and fantastic and power to everyone who can be the Christopher Gardner and, and, and adhere to that throughout their lifetime. But the more that we're actually offering those in-between options, America as a culture has a hard time with nuance, but we need to really lean into it because that's where we can capture the greatest percentage of the population. So meat is a condiment. This is the CIA concept um, within the protein flip. That's that two ounce portion. It's not, you didn't have to completely skip it, but you don't need, you know, eight ounces, right? You don't need a heaping entree portion. This is where sharing can be great, but it doesn't have to only be in sharing contexts. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, Jack could have, you know, had just a little bit of chicken, a few bites if he'd shared his tikka masala and ordered a bunch of other plant-based dishes. Um, but even when you're by yourself, if food service operators can, can offer, and, and it's great whenever just a simple swap, I'll share UC Riverside, one of the MCRC members, simple menu change where they decoupled all the animal proteins from their salad. So you can have two ounces of chicken or beef or egg or whatever, but it doesn't come automatically in the salad or in the bowl. Mm -hmm. And it allows for that kind of garnish or condiment or again, kind of omnivorous in between space. So I think the more that we really look for ways to, um, to not be put into those um, boxes of, of all or nothing, again, we're gonna capture the, the greatest uh, diner base. And the data shows that's really where most people are, are feeling like, yeah, that's absolutely something I can do because I'm not giving up everything that I, you know, uh, all, all that meat and all those other opportunities. Um, and then it also gives them more chances for positive feedback loops, trying the plant-based foods. Hey, I actually didn't add the two ounces and I felt great. I was still full later and it was delicious. Mm. 
Thank you, Sophie. That's such a great reminder that Plant Forward is a big tent approach and there's no one way to do it. It's uh, lots of different kind of ways to reach that eating style. Um, we are running up on time. I do have a question, Christopher. I'd love to get your thoughts. When you talk about protein quality and the quality of plant proteins, we know from our research that consumers do associate value and premiumness with meat. So do you have any kind of tools you think would be helpful to help uh, consumers associate more value with plant-based proteins and plant-based foods? So, you know, we need more sports stars and performance stars. So when that movie Game Changers came out, that really was a game changer. I actually watched a whole rowing boat at Stanford go vegan when they saw that. Wow. So, wow there's an example for me. There's an elite person, right? And so there was an elite cyclist and a weightlifter, and it wasn't actually just about speed. So I think if we can get some more of those leaders, so we have great scientists, that's good. But, you know, how about Beyonce and how about J-Lo and how about, you know, tall basketball players? So there's uh, there's several basketball players out there that have gone plant based. And so I, yeah. I think repackaging the messaging that way um, mm -hmm. will make it more attractive to people. Not one more research paper from me. Honestly, <laughs> some of those data. <laughs> are decades old. I need to repackage the data in a different way and work in combination with some of them. Yeah, thank you. I, I echo that. And I wonder too, in, in our day and age, these modern times with TikTok and Instagram, the way recipes are getting viral nowadays, like they never did before, I think notably from TikTok, the pasta and stuff, can that help also advance the narrative of plant forward and show the value of plant proteins? Um, let's see. Well, I think uh, Katie is jumping in in a second uh, with some final comments for the panel. And then um, the, our last question for each of you will be if you could share a top takeaway uh, once we hear from Katie. Yeah, thank you all so much for this insightful presentation. We're not quite done, so um, please stick with us. I just wanted to pop in to give some logistical uh, tidbits about the upcoming, upcoming networking break. So you'll see on the left-hand side of your screen, um, or if you're on a mobile phone, possibly on the bottom of your screen, um, a couple options. Uh, there's a session tab where you can join a couple authors to chat about their books, including our very own Sophie Egan. I'll put a link in the chat after this. Uh, you could also join the some networking for some fun one-on-one -on -one, four minute conversations. And um, the icebreaker for today is what is your primary sustainability priority for 2021? So feel free to chat about that or other topics. Um, and uh, in the Innovation Hub, you can go there and get some more insights on data and different presentations. So um, please enjoy that. Um, but now back to our panelists, Marie. Thank you, Katie. And thank you to Taylor in our chat. She mentioned Lizzo just posted a walnut meat chorizo on her accounts and has millions of followers. So there's one example. Um, all right, let's get to our top takeaways. Uh, Carly, would you mind going first? Uh, top takeaway for the audience regarding advancing plant forward and helping to advance protein literacy. Sure, um, I'm gonna be boring. My top takeaway is the same as I said at the beginning. You know, it's really not drastic changes. People aren't gonna change their diet, small steps. It's getting that one person to maybe have one vegetarian, vegan, you know, meal a day. It's maybe having someone, you know, as Sophie said, oh, hey, wait a minute, I can enjoy this salad just the same without meat. It's those small steps that collectively together, I think will help advance um, plant forward and plant-based eating. I agree, thank you, Carly. And uh, Christopher, top takeaway from you. So I'm a data geek, sorry, I'm a race researcher. So I want the chefs at the dining halls, at the work sites, at the restaurants, chains. So work with somebody on data, collect some data, build some narratives out of that, build some messaging around that. And so coming up with some of these new partners, just because I want some new partners, by the way, anybody want to call me? Um, yeah, capturing those data in a way that they can be messaged uh, is really powerful for me expanding my outreach. And I would think could be really rewarding for some of the chefs. I was really impressed how many chefs at universities latched onto this quickly and were very excited about partnering with researchers. I thought it was going to make their lives busier, but it made it more rewarding for many of them, hmm. as far as I can. 
Yeah, cool. Thank you, Christopher. I agree with that. More data, more research will help us, only help us. Uh, Sophie, top takeaway? Yeah, well, wonderful invitation from Christopher. That, that's right there worth a lot. Um, I would really say that, you know, we need the science, we need the evidence base to make sure that this is rooted in facts, what we're advancing. We need chefs like Chef Tony, who just made this most beautiful, delicious, craveable dish to ensure that the food in the first place tastes freaking amazing. But one narrative, we have to talk that is super inviting, accessible, inclusive, and appealing to everyone. And so, my urging is just to all the chefs and scientists and uh, nutritionists and, and sustainability folks out there to really work with your marketing folks and, and don't take for granted that um, that the language will will kind of. Um, suffice uh, to, to really make sure that those delicious things you already invested in sell. Um, and so make, set those up for success by really um, spending some time uh, on the words you use. And the Edgy Veggies Toolkit is a great spot to, to start. Yes, awesome. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you all for your sharing your valuable insights with us this afternoon. Uh, looks like we're right at time, so I'll turn it over to you, Katie. Perfect. Thank you, Marie, and thank you to all the panelists. This has been a great discussion. Um, we will see all of the panelists later, hopefully um, in some of the different sessions, hanging out with us. Um, for the In the meantime, please enjoy the networking session. Hopefully we'll see you all uh, in Sophie's Meet the Author or a different Meet the Author booth, and we'll be back on the main stage at um, 2 p.m. Pacific or 5 p.m. Eastern. Thank you all so much.